now we're going to go live and let me just take it from there to see how we can greet people and all of that. Okay. All right. And I think we are live. All right. So okay. everyone who is watching, I am so excited to present Katya Marozova to you. And in order for us to start this very, very exciting and I would say enlightening stream tonight. And thank you for being with us tonight. Hi, Julie, on Friday night. And uh, this topic is definitely very, very interesting. It's about attachment theory. And it is about what kind of, what kind of uh, attachment style do you have? And how does this influence your relationships? And so when you know what kind of attachment style you have, you can adjust your behavior and you can adjust your communications in a way that is going to bring you the right kind of partner who is going to make you really happy. And when you don't know what kind of attachment style you have, there is a great danger, of course, to be attracting and to be attracted to a wrong person. And even if you are attracted to the right person, there is a great danger that you're not going to be able to keep that person because of your attachment style. So stick with us and we're going to go deeply into this topic. And so what I would love for all of our audience to do is to help us uh, get more visibility from Facebook. And that means you telling us that we are amazing, right, Katya? That we are women who are rocking the world. So please put yes and send us hearts and everything and just to support this, this live stream and also tell us where you're coming from. And of course, I have my cell phone here, so I'm going to be able to see if there are any questions that you have for Katya. Okay, my love. So and also one more thing, hashtag live that's what you need to do in order for us to gain more visibility and i already see some people are joining so exciting to see you baba and juliet and yes and i i hope our european friends are still up as well so hashtag live let me introduce katya marozova to you so katya marozova is a coach with many years of experience and she's got the part exactly that I usually don't work with, which is she specifically has experience, a lot of experience working with men for many, many years. And not just men, but men who are open to personal development, yeah, men who are conscious, men who really want to have the best relationship of their lives, which means men that we are looking for, the kind of men that women in my programs are geared up to get as their best relationship of their life. And so I want to share with you, and of course, you most of you know who I am. I'm Luba Evans. And uh, as always, um, my mom is chatting me when I'm going live. Which is <laughs> fun. Yeah. And so I am a dating coach and love expert. I, I actually really don't like how it sounds. I'm not a love expert. No one is a love expert. Love is a mystery of its own. Okay, I definitely have tons of experience at helping you attract love and keep love, but let's just keep it um, teaching coach and, and tantra teacher. And so I met Katya several years ago and in the middle of this pretty complicated coaching landscape, Katya struck me as a person of incredible integrity, great power, true compassion and fantastic skill that she used to work with her clients. So I want to introduce you to this wonderful coach and, and a colleague of mine, Katya Marozova. Please welcome, please put yeses and yeah, Katya, yay. Hi. Right. Hi. So please tell us a little bit about yourself. What an intro, thank you. And thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, I'm just really excited to, to talk about this with you guys. This is what I'm really passionate about. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I've been coaching for the last eight years and I first got into coaching. Uh, I, I have coached a lot of men. I first got into coaching, helping men recover from a breakup. And so of course, you know, after you recover from a breakup, the next kind of obvious next step is how do I find a, a relationship and how do I not make the same mistakes over again? And so I started helping guys attract women. 
Um, and yeah, I've worked with both men and women somewhere along that journey. Uh, a few years back, I actually, I, I have a lot of success with my clients. My clients, you know, find amazing women. They also become really secure in their skin, which is at the core, like the core tenet of my, um, my work. And this is actually before I ever got introduced into attachment theory. It was just something that was really important to me. It was something that I noticed that worked really well in helping people attract healthy partners and lasting relationships into their life. And at the same time, I noticed that I was really struggling with insecurity in my own life. And I started, you know, learning a lot about um, developmental trauma and shock trauma. I started getting certified in somatic experiencing, which works with shock trauma. And I started learning about attachment theory. And it was kind of like this, this missing piece for, for my own life. And, and it made me realize like why I was experiencing so much insecurity, not just in my relationships, but other goals and dreams um, that I had in my life. So that's when I like went all in into, you know, working with attachment theory for, you know, my own healing. Cause I was like, my clients are getting all of this amazing goodness. Like <laughs> what about me? <laughs> so, um, so that's how I started working with um, attachment theory. And I also started to notice that, you know, not everyone was is created equally in some ways. I mean, everyone is created equally, but not everyone has the same imprint. And so I was getting certain clients that were having this particular imprint where they were really going hot and cold in relationships and others that were, you know, really clinging and, and warding people away. And so I just noticed these distinct differences. So I wanted to, you know, obviously learn about that. And so attachment theory is all about understanding your unique relationship imprint. And I know you actually talk a lot about that as well in your own work. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about me and how, how I got here, yeah. How exciting. And I do know that you went through your own personal transformational journey getting clear on things healing things just like all of us really yeah and then it's so wonderful to be that bridge for the others from what you came from and where you are right now so let's go more into this attachment theory attachment theory first of all uh why is it important to know um what attachment style you have can you maybe give us an example of somebody and you know i know that my uh, audience they we want to know about men we want to know about like what is happening and you were so kind that when you shared with me how men were looking at this one particular quality that a woman must have in order for them to really really uh, have her stand out from the crowd, which is her vibrancy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and this one red flag that men have, which is seeing if she's going to be a drain. And I loved it so much. Those words in particular that we don't know about. And unless you, you know, I spoke to maybe, I don't know, 900 women in the last two, three years, you probably spoke to tons of men. So I want to hear like those words. So, so, so valuable, so important. And so maybe you can tell us uh, about men and when, and how, how knowing their attachment style has helped some men, for example, to find or keep his love. Yeah. Well, you know, this is where I kind of stop differentiating between men and women, because mm -hmm. I actually think that all people are just looking for a secure relationship. Like you just, everyone, in my opinion, everyone wants a stable relationship that is also passionate, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of like the dream. That's I think everyone's desire. And so when I started learning about attachment theory, I stopped looking at like, what do men want versus what do women want? Because attachment theory to me is like, is a bridge. You know, and I think what people are really looking for, let's say what men are looking for, since we're talking to the female audience is a secure partner, you know, is all my, the, the guys that I work with, you know, they, they really want a woman who um, can hold her own in the world, like who has a life of her own, who has dreams and ambitions and drive 
and um, is independent and can take care of herself, which is actually a really big piece that plays into your attachment style because often people who have like who are anxious preoccupied women who are anxious preoccupied or fearful avoidant can often have this instability in their life and they're looking for a man to to kind of save them or to um yeah i think that's that that puts it uh, correctly like they're looking for someone to fill like this void within them and a man a secure man an independent man as someone who works on himself wants a woman who can stand on her own two feet and can also um you know uh be uh what's what's the word i'm looking for um can can be another hole in the relationship so so yeah um and, and be another hole in the relation yeah yeah I hear you. so let's go back to those two very interesting terms anxious avoidant right and what's the other term that you use anxious preoccupied and anxious. fearful avoidant all right anxious preoccupied and fearful avoidant so whoever wants to know what that means please put yes into the comments all right so i am dying to learn what is it and what is this, this woman who is really so so anxious or so fearful so avoidant who is still looking for a man to complete her and i want to tell you katya that i maybe i'm like so, so super lucky maybe just not really truly my audience but i tend to work and attract women who actually are very powerful and who yeah. do have a life of their own Yes, yeah, yeah. so if you're a woman like that, put yes into the comments. And um, yeah, but I want to know, I want to know what is happening? What is happening? What are those terms? Yeah, and and just so that just so that I'm clear, I think that you know, any a woman can be career oriented and have an amazing career and still be, you know, still have a fearful avoidant or anxious preoccupied or a dismissive avoidant attachment style. And so um, what was your question again? Yeah, what are those terms? What do they mean? Yeah. Tell us, so, so what, are, what is that terminology about the attachment? Yeah, what, yeah. What so let me go back a little bit. So um, John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth are the kind of the inventors of attachment theory. So they kind of stumbled upon attachment theory in their own way, and then they came together to develop it further. And really, like, um, there was this uh, test, the study that was done years ago by Mary Ainsworth, it was called the strange situation, where um, it's, <laughs> it may today seem kind of controversial, but basically, um, the study was how, how does like basically do your childhood patterns impact your adult relationships and so the study um basically was conducted where a mother would walk in with her child and she would um uh then you know play with this uh play with the toys hang out with the child leave the room and then for a minute, say, you know, tell the child she was leaving, leave the room for a minute and then come back. And then they would kind of measure like, how would the child respond to her leaving and to her coming back? And out of this study and, you know, other studies, attachment theory was formed where basically people realized, they realized that uh, the child, children would react in four different ways. They would either, the mother would leave, the child would get upset, she would come back and the child would calm down, which is kind of like a secure person. And secure uh, people are characterized in adult relationships as people who, you know, aren't worried about whether their partner is always going to be there. You know, they're, they aren't worried if their partner is going to leave. They aren't worried about, you know, their worth or their value in a relationship. They're, you know, secure. They yeah. know their value they know that their partner is coming back yeah so the anxious preoccupied child would you know get really upset and when the mother would come back would have a really hard time coming calming down mm -hmm. and so as adults anxious preoccupied are typically characterized as people who have an abandonment wound and so mm -hmm. it's it's very difficult for an anxious preoccupied to really relax in a relationship mm -hmm. because they kind of always feel like the other shoe was about to drop and that this mm -hmm. person is going to leave them 
And, and that comes from a childhood where a maternal caregiver was very inconsistent. And so they occupied, yeah, could never tell what was going to happen next. Mm -hmm. So I just want to ask people to self-identify, yeah, and put, and put what do you think you are in the comments, okay? So it just went through two, right? The first one was the secure, yeah? And the second one was anxious preoccupied. And maybe you've identified that your mother, maybe or any parent, right? Is it any parent? Yeah, was unstable. Uh, yeah, was not stable, right? Primary caregivers, yeah, okay. absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, fearful avoidance is basically the mother would leave the and then come back, and the child would kind of be disoriented. Like sometimes would be avoidant, sometimes would be anxious, but it the, it would be inconsistent. And um, the behavior was inconsistent. And so this is typically mm -hmm. when, when people have um, like early trauma, like for instance, if they had a maternal caregiver who was also unresolved, like maybe the mother was dealing with depression around birth or the first two years of life. Um, this can also be characterized as someone who's been, you know, has physical abuse in their history or maybe sexual trauma as well. Mm -hmm. So fearful avoidance, um, specifically in relationships, they, they're the hot and cold partner. So they have a hard time. They come in hot into the relationship, but they can also come out of the relationship just as hot. They have a fear of being engulfed and trapped because early relationships said that, you know, um, this is not safe. Relationships aren't safe. I want connection, but I also fear connection at the same time. Yeah. And may I ask you something? So I have a client who yeah. is very, we got very lucky. She was at the end of her ticking bomb and she had a child. And now I'm also helping with the, with the relationship with the child. And so this child is a really independent boy. And uh, sometimes, he says, go away. He's very young. He's a, a year and a half old. And uh, when he doesn't like something, he is trying to escape. And he says, go away. Don't talk to me. Don't touch me. Is that, is that what you are talking about? Fearful avoidant? Um, I, well, I don't, I'm not a child psychologist, so I couldn't tell you based on, you know, where the child is in the development, but I think that could be, that could be another facet of attachment theory where in, in relationships, we actually want this freedom to explore. So when a child is developing, right, like they, they want to explore, they don't want help, they want to figure it out themselves, they want to gain independence. And so, you know, that's kind of how I might relate to what she's what she's going through, or what she's dealing with right now. Okay. Yeah, and sometimes actually, when, you know, um, a, a children are, let's say, like, kind of have an overbearing parent and and the mm. child doesn't get to explore then later in life either their exploratory skills get kind of stunted where it's like oh i don't i can't trust myself i can't trust my own power or they move away from people who are controlling you know who mm. are missing of the you know maternal or paternal figure that was kind of overbearing and didn't really give them that space to mm -hmm. explore. and i'm wondering also there is this huge debate and i don't know if you know it but uh maybe this is something interesting also to explore and the debate has been for decades about if a child is crying and the child is hungry, a newborn, do you feed the child right away? Or do you schedule the child and discipline the child to nurse at, at certain times? So for example, if the child is not being given what they want, which is the immediate abundance of food or milk, do you think that influences their attachment style in any kind of form? I know that this is controversial. I personally do, you know, I, I think that, but again, like there's like this age that there's a certain point in time where children, you know, are more independent, but I think like up until two years, two, three years, they're completely dependent on a caregiver. So I don't have children. So I, if, if I had a child and my child wanted to eat, you know, I would not try to <laughs> stop them personally. So 
that's my personal take on it. And I think we're kind of entering the realm of, you know, parental preferences. So I kind of don't want to touch that. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. So let's keep moving. All right. So we've got this we've got the secure style, we've got the anxious style, right? We've got the avoidance style, what else? What else do we have? So we covered anxious, preoccupied, fearful avoidant, and then we have um, dismissive avoidant. And so I think that probably, I would guess maybe that a lot, a lot of the women who you work with are probably anxious, preoccupied, and they're maybe um, matching with dismissive avoidant partners. So dismissive avoidant, um, let's say men, but it's men and women. So these are the people who um, struggled with connection early in life. They were met with, again, either like neglect or maybe a lot of like a suffocating parent to the point where they really needed to like avoid to assert their own independence. So they can have some of the earlier trauma, like for instance, um, uh, again, maybe like a, de a depressed mother where like emotional cues were not learned by the child. So a lot of times dismissive avoidance, especially get a bad rap because they match with anxious, preoccupied partners, which are highly emotionally attuned, almost overtly attuned to every little thing, every little signal of is everything okay? And dismissive avoidance are on the other end of the spectrum where they're not as, they're not as in tune with their emotions. They're not as in tune with emotional cues. They're much more information oriented people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a lot, sometimes dismissive avoidance also grow up with a, you know, caretakers who um, they're like the, they end up being the track star or they end up being mom's confidant, but their life becomes like their parents start to live through them. And so they grow up to have trust issues, you know, to not really trust that someone else actually has their best interest in mind. Mm -hmm. They also really, tr they also learn to be very self-reliable. They learn to be dependent to, to pretty much only be dependent on themselves. I can trust myself. I can't trust anyone else. Okay. So I'm not even going to try. Okay, so let's just pause for one second and let's ask our audience if this reminds you of anyone that you've been dating, right? Like somebody, maybe a male, which is the usual for now, this ha mostly heterosexual space uh, that we're in right now. Maybe probably not forever but um yeah does it remind you of anybody who feels like they can only trust themselves right that at the end of the day it's safer and easier to come back to their own shell right how does it happen so what can be maybe Katya you can give us an example how a relationship is going well and everything seems fine right and romantic evenings and a glass of Malbec in the sunset you know almost planning a trip to Paris and and all of a sudden all of a sudden you got really close and he is not texting he's not calling and you're like not just looking at the at the cell phone you're like listening to it and seeing if it's died right so what happens what's yeah. that moment what, what just happened why did it happen i mean I, honestly i don't know how to answer that question in a very like there's a lot of things that could in a i don't have one answer for that question i think mm -hmm. a lot of things could be happening you know i would say there's probably a lot of um cues there's a lot of things that happened before that you know so for instance if let's say an anxious preoccupied is with a dismissive avoidant and all of a sudden just the dismissive avoidant we call it um a deactivating strategy so for instance they're they're there they're involved they're the intimacy is growing and then all of a sudden they start to deactivate they start to shut down they start to move away from the relationship mm -hmm. so anxious preoccupies uh, are characterized as moving towards relationship mm -hmm. and dismissive avoidance are always characterized as moving away from relationship so it's like this cat and mouse kind of thing and um so for instance you could have reached a point of um they, you know, the dismissive avoidant hit a, a wall of like, okay, we're, we're getting too, too close, too mm -hmm. close for comfort, you know, or maybe the, 
again, I'm just guessing here, but depending, I think I would need a lot more details about what's going on in the connection. Or maybe, you know, the dismissive avoidant is noticing that this person is more like character, like consistently moving towards the relationship and they don't yeah. have a lot of space to kind of exist and be themselves and have the relationship on their terms as well. You know, cause a lot of times, um, anxious preoccupied have a tendency to have a lot of needs, you know, and, um, and again, that comes from that inconsistency in childhood. And so a lot of times the things that we, the needs that we didn't get met, the thing that we didn't get to develop in our childhood relationships, we kind of play that out in our adult relationships. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so if that starts to get played out, you're kind of both doing the dance, you know, you're doing right. this dance together where um, one person just wants to be acknowledged, like the dismissive avoidant also really just wants to like exist in a relationship and be acknowledged and be um, like praised for the things that they do, for their consistency, for their loyalty, for their maybe generosity, you know, and if the anxious preoccupied comes in and is, you know, critical or um, controlling or has to have everything their way, you know, it, it like it pings right into, well, I'm not enough. And if I'm not enough, I don't want to be in this connection because this feels mm -hmm. all too familiar. Mm -hmm. And so it feels to this uh, anxious avoidant that no matter what they do is not going to be enough, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore they are not enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they feel criticized or they feel like, yeah, they're not being appreciated. Is, yeah. that right? is there any other fear that the anxious avoidant might have? Is there anything else? Like, for example, for example, everything is going really well. Nobody's criticizing them. Nobody really wants anything from them that much. But they're just feeling that, oh, my God, this can be something serious. Mm -hmm. So can that fear alone push them over the edge and start and make them make them pull away? Potentially, potentially. Yeah. I mean, especially if they have a fear of intimacy. And that's the other thing yeah. too, is that it's not just like the childhood patterns. It's like, what have they experienced throughout their life? Because while your attachment style can be pretty static, it's also malleable based on the relationships mm -hmm. that you have. So if you've been in a lot of relationships where, you know, I've experienced, um, uh, let's create this mystery client where she's in this, you know, great relationship, things are going well, but this, this man that she's with, you know, he just got out of a long-term relationship where there was betrayal, you know, where he was mm -hmm. betrayed. And now he's met this great woman, things seem to be going really well, but as intimacy starts to grow, like, well, there's issues that he hasn't resolved within himself. So he can't bring himself to you know, to commit. So what kind of issues could those be that, um, he, that would prevent him from committing? Well, as I mentioned, like he was betrayed in a previous relationship. Mm -hmm. So as he starts to go into intimacy, you know, I would guess that he starts fearing betrayal. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Or yeah, that could be a possibility. Yeah. So he starts reading into, into, the signals from that angle of pain body, right? And and mm -hmm. so just in order to avoid the pain, he starts to withdraw. Is that is that what you're saying? That that, yeah. Yeah. that has been unresolved. So in some way, is it possible maybe to speculate again, not necessarily in all the cases, but just theoretically, that um, let's say he was betrayed mm -hmm. and instead of deeply understanding that the reason he was betrayed was that for example that he didn't pay attention to this woman or that he chose poorly based on his own uh background and his own upbringing or for whatever other reason that let's say he made a conclusion that all women are traitors or that the feminine in general is uh, unreliable or that all women are crazy, which is something that we hear a lot, 
-hmm. you know mm -hmm. so yeah 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 a lot of men who were betrayed they 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 fear the irrational element um in women and so for example if he's coming in with this kind of uh, luggage with this kind of baggage yeah. and uh, so he's going to be on the fence yeah right so his yeah. issues haven't been worked with right yeah yeah so so in this particular case you know he was i think probably more of like a fearful avoidant and mm -hmm. so i think what is important for um to me like what works really well in the start of a relationship is if both people move slowly so you know if mm -hmm. If you as a woman can slow down, you know, and, and pace the relationship, you're going to learn a lot because, you know, in this situation that I'm describing, they actually both moved really fast into the relationship. And so I think a lot of pain and a lot of heartbreak can be avoided when people learn how to move towards, you know, what we call in attachment theories, earn secure. Right. So so you you start to learn how to pace yourself. You know that when you enter into when you start dating someone that this person isn't, you know, the solution to your problems. They also aren't perfect, you know, that they're going to have flaws. They're going to have things that they're bringing to the table that um, that are going to that you're going to learn over time. And it's actually in your best interest to move slowly into the, into the dynamic, you know? Yeah, there's yeah. A, okay. go ahead. Um, there's a Stan Tatkin. He, uh, I would recommend his books. He um, wrote a book called Wired for Dating. It's attachment theory and he talks about dating. It's a, it's a great book, but he talks about, you know, he's like in the first year of dating, you, you don't know who this person is. You're basically, and I think Chris Rock said it, he's like, you're just on drugs, you know? Like you're not really relating to each other like you're real people. You're just kind of like in the, you know, the ooey gooey, like, you know, spell of, of love. And so I think, you know, it's, it's in everyone's best interest to move slowly. I think moving slowly shows a sign that you think that you are worth it, you know? And that you are, and, and the beautiful thing is when you do this, that it's, you immediately see what the other person is bringing to the table. Like, do they want to rush in? Oh, well, why do they want to do that? And where's that fear coming from, you know? Or, yeah. yeah. And then also, you know, relationships aren't perfect. I think the more that we can be secure partners, the more we are also a secure base for other people, you know, like ultimately, we will most likely attract ideally like the best version of our parents to us you know really the best version of our parents yeah that's yes <laughs> that, that's kind of what we can expect you I know love i love that so if we can pause just for a second again i want to ask our audience if yeah. you feel like you've rushed at any point in time in your relationships right and that there was this beautiful canvas that you could paint your dreams onto and this very enjoyable drug-like cocktail that happens in the beginning when we have a tendency to idealize our partner and we have a tendency to be maximalistic and all of a sudden just feeling so happy and so joyful and feeling like, oh my God, that's it. All of my problems have been solved. Now I'm really, really happy just to really observe this other person and to see how they are in interaction with the world, how they are responding to the crisis, how they're responding to the pandemic, how they're responding in an emergency situation. Do they freak out? Do they, are they loyal? Do they lie? Do they have a purpose in life and all of that? So when you allow for that to unfold gradually, um yeah that is a very high value behavior and for sure that is a setup for success and i want to tell you katya also that what i've noticed and maybe you've noticed that too in, in in some of your work is that um there are two major existential desires that's what i've noticed uh, in um in human design which is one is to merge and another one is to be an individual and so sometimes uh, some people who are more prone to more extreme states, sometimes they want to merge very, very fast in order to be able to 
withdraw and immediately come back as an individual, almost like to prove that story to themselves that, oh my God, thank God, I don't really have to be connected with that person forever. I'm just going to burn through it and be free again. Mm -hmm. And so what, what style would that be? What style of attachment would you say those people have? I think that sounds like the fearful avoidant attachment style. And it's, you know, I also, I want to, as you were talking, I was imagining, you know, sometimes it sounds kind of like intense, like, oh, they're avoidant, you know, or they're anxious. Like, I like to look at it. And there's another great book that I've just is kind of like my Bible, but um, there's a book called um, Healing Developmental Trauma by Dr. Lawrence Heller. And he talks about, these um, these ways that we enter into relationship as adaptive survival styles. Mm -hmm. So like these, these things that we do in relationships, they are adaptive, you know, because at one point they worked. At yes. one point, these, these things that we do, these like, it's almost like an automaticity, right? They worked and they protected us you know, and during a time when we were most vulnerable, right, we were dependent on another human being entirely dependent. Mm -hmm. And so when, you know, when we go into romantic relationship, there's this other, this YouTube guy that I love, he put it in this really great way. He was talking about how, um, you know, like, people asking him, well, in my friendships, I'm secure. Why does this only happen in my love relationships? And he was talking about how when you enter into a romantic relationship, it's like you're getting cl closest to that childhood imprint. Like you're, you're, you're touching into the highest level of activation. And so you kind of, it makes you a little bit crazy, right? And so, so that, that your question was, why do these people burn through, you know, these relationships and then leave? Well, it's not like they're doing it on purpose. You know, it's, it's for a fearful avoidant, especially, and I, I actually um, historically have a fearful avoidant attachment style. And I've, you know, worked really hard on myself to move towards earn secure. But a lot of times, you know, if you've experienced abuse, if you've experienced bullying, if you've been, you know, um, betrayed by like your, your caregiver or someone so, so intimate in your life, you know, you struggle with emotional dysregulation. And so when you, when you meet someone, you idolize them so much, you know, it's, it's, it's like, you're not really relating to them as a person. And so, and, and then once the first sign of conflict happens, your image is shattered, like the image of their idealization is shattered, it breaks. And then just as you idolize them, you throw them into the gutter internally, you know, and then you start to deactivate and move out of their relationship. It's a very painful pattern to work yeah. through. You and know? it feels like Torah has been warning about that by saying, don't create idols. You know, yeah. that, that, that's really any time when we choose an object or, or a representative, whether it's a guru, a teacher, or yeah. any kind of any kind of figure that we project those divine qualities on, it's always difficult then to fall or for that person also to, to fall from the pedestal. And I can tell you that as a person who was a spiritual teacher and is, you know, for, for many, many years, I'm always extremely leery when somebody starts to, uh, you know, go on their knees in front of me or tell me that I'm flawless because I know what's going to happen next. And what's going to happen next is for sure they're going to project their parents onto me and then they're going to put me into the gutter right after that. While in reality, the adult way of looking at any kind of person, whether this person is your partner, your parent, or your child, or your dog, yeah, whatever that being is, just to understand that they, like everyone else, want to be happy and don't want to be unhappy. And they have a full spectrum of, we can say angels and demons or a full spectrum of emotions which are available within the human design. And that sometimes they show this and sometimes they show that according to, again, what they, are learned, what they have learned 
which is the personality, which is actually the strategy, strategy for survival itself. The ego is the strategy for survival. So they're just going to be turning, right? In different, yeah. different ways. Yeah. yeah, but it's not as fun to live when you think that that middle path, as Buddhists would say, yeah, like it makes you adult and mature, but how much fun is it when you think, oh my God, so this person is God, yeah? Oh my God, this person is like so ideal, right? Is That's great fun. Yeah. Isn't it? Well, it's, I mean, I think it's, it's actually, as someone who idolized a lot, you know, especially when I started, when I um, just got into coaching and I started to like, go to these seminars and watch these people on the stage and you know talk so well and be so wise and you know i um it was actually a perfect match for like my my trauma pattern you know and so i never i don't think i ever wanted to idolize i think when we idolize we see what we want to see in ourselves but we can't you know so i think that a lot of times when we attached to partners it's because and idolize them is because we see something that we we deeply desire to connect within ourselves but feel like we can't we feel like we can't have that and so i think you know when people are like deeply idolizing for me it was because i had a lot of shame you know because i would actually really compare myself to that person you know and i used to idolize men as well and that was <laughs> that was really hard and that you know landed me in a lot of unhealthy relationships where i thought that someone was going to you know save me um save me mm -hmm. from myself you know save me and yeah and absolutely. Kind of, yeah and it and i think that even like even if you have an amazing career you could still and have you know a lot of financial stability i think you could still fall into this pattern of like wanting to be saved in your romantic relationship it can actually be really destabilizing so yeah i can imagine and this definitely goes um according to the fairy tales that are so present in our culture like cinderella being saved from this misery by the prince mm -hmm. who found that she has a small shoe size which of course implies that she's size zero you know and also <laughs> has a small vagina most likely right and then sleeping beauty again who is waiting for someone to come and awaken her mm -hmm. and and pretty woman which is already the equivalent right in the 90s so yeah in some way we have been definitely programmed and that is the product of the patriarchy that some kind of big man powerful and omnipresent and uh, the shiva you know who knows everything about everything is going to come and he's going to take you and pick you up and take you across the the boiling river or something like that and bring you into the safe place yeah, yeah so if you've ever experienced anything like this this kind of desire or this kind of thinking that this is what you're really attracted by. Yeah, please put it into the comments. We would like to know what has been happening with you. Yeah. yeah. I was also going to say from like, from an attachment perspective, like that wanting to be saved comes from the longing that you experience as a child. Like if you didn't have your, your needs met. Right. So, and at that point in time, like your, again, your parental figures, your, your maternal figure, you know, they are like gods, you know, they, they are, they are the, the dominion, <laughs> you know, they kind of rule the dominion. And so, um, and especially if they didn't give you, you know, the tools that you needed to, you know, individuate, to know that you are also special and that you, you know, that you have your own beautiful tools and um, talents and gifts to bring to the world and to, to bring to a partner, then it can be really easy to, to fall into that pattern, you know? So I think, I think a lot of these, I love that you talked about the fairy tales, but I do, I think they like, they emulate what we experience as, as children, you know, and the, the, conflict that is unresolved as children that then lives on into into adulthood yeah and yeah and i feel like also the 19th century romantic love and don quixote and and uh, the tournaments of of gentlemen 
they were all about that. It was all about rescuing, either, either, either idealizing this, um, this woman who is this Rapunzel in her high mm -hmm. tower, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Or rescuing the damsel in distress. And again, that is playing into those various attachment styles. And I'm just curious. So what is the goal? What is the healthy template? So if we imagine one very secure person and not a very secure person, where is the thrill when we are so secure? Is it, is it, is it anywhere to be found? Well, see, that's the thing is, I think it is actually like a little bit more boring. You know, yeah. I think that, you <laughs> I, I mean, that's the, that's the reality is that <laughs> people who, who have long relationships, they're, they're not looking for thrills constantly. You know, they find thrills outside of their relationship. They find thrills because the, the thrill, when there's too much thrill in relationship, it's more like drama, right? It's more like a, a roller coaster. Um, so I think, uh, I think that if you, and, and I noticed that as I've moved towards security, it's like, I, it is, there is a lot, it's a lot more boring, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's not as, it's not as exciting. And, um, and I think that that's okay. I think you get more comfortable with it because, um, and, and of course you can, you can have rituals and beautiful things because ideally in a secure relationship, you have someone who's also receptive, who you can talk to who wants to bring more fun and pleasure into the connection i'm not saying that it should be robbed of that in any way you know i know lots of people who are in secure relationships who still have a great time you know both in and out of the bedroom but i think that it becomes this co create like your relationship and the turmoil like the turmoil that you feel when you're in an insecure relationship is not the the fun anymore you know it's what you co-create together you know like you choose each other and then you decide to create outwardly um and yeah, I think I think that's how I would, I would yeah answer. yeah and I love that idea I love that idea of outsourcing the thrill in <laughs> areas of your life and i can tell you that there are so many areas where we can push ourselves and stretch ourselves and stay uh, and face our discomfort and our darkness and one of those discomforts definitely could be something like public speaking or something like uh, starting a business and running that roller coaster and taking yeah. risks right mm -hmm. or pushing yourself to be the biggest version of who you are and that is why in 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 my teaching and katya i really hope that men are going to be like who are maybe are coming from you or men who are growing in in consciousness are going to be on board with that and so what i say is that the the new type of a relationship the enlightened relationship the relationship that instead of either putting us to sleep bored to death or making us all crazy because we just want to make sure that we're going to conquer that person so the enlightened relationship is about co-creation and it is about bringing something into the world which where we are of service yeah. so that we are kind of done figuring ourselves out as very complex creatures that rather we look at our personalities and strategies to have and avoid intimacy and we celebrate that but the relationship is not about digging into our own uh, belly button all the time but it's you know it's rather it's rather about seeing how are we together more powerful than yeah. separately and what is it that we can do and create together that would be of service for the world and the thrill could be from well let's take a risk let's buy an island let's let's create this huge event right let's play this improv music let's let's do something together which is exciting right which is thrilling yeah or like you know, like or bonnie and clyde <laughs> right yeah or even like taking a pottery class together or going on a road trip to the desert you know and it, it doesn't have to be like it can be simple you can create in simple ways as well as like these beautiful you know co-creating partnership type of ways and but i you know the one thing i wanted to say too is i think it's not 
I think that when you start to enter into secure love, like there is this void of, of drama, you know, there is someone who's available. And I think initially, like when people start to adapt to that, it does feel different. You know, it does feel unnerving because sometimes safety and security is scary, you know, Absolutely. because then in, in that, like people can actually see you you know, instead of like the drama of the relationship constantly distracting from who you really are, like you yeah. actually get to be seen. And so, I mean, I think that's pretty damn thrilling, like to, to be in a relationship with someone who like sees you and honors you. And I know you talk about this a lot, like as a goddess and as someone who is, you know, um, capable of creation, you know, because then like you get to see as, as, your like your truth you know you yeah. get to be with someone who wants to like build that up with you so I think yeah. that's really beautiful and then also you get more attracted to their creative force rather than their possibility to uh to make you relive that trauma from the childhood and I you know I want to share with you actually I have a client right now who uh for the first time has attracted a secure relationship and who yeah for the first time she's 55 and uh, in the last session with her which was last week she was sharing that she's reading this book about the woman who survived cancer and the book is about the um territory or land between sickness and health and oh it's it's almost this is very counterintuitive but how in some way this woman who's recovered from cancer is missing her sickness because that sickness has identified her and on who she is right that asset yeah. the same thing what you're saying is that all of a sudden oh wow there is the security so i'm not like being played anymore there is no like little carrot in front of me i really need to uh be available now to myself and see my own depth and how I want to be seen. And yeah. Scary, right? And, yeah. And also like from, from the, uh, that's so like beautifully put. And I think also from like a nervous system perspective, you know, that is, is expansion, right? So if we're used to contraction, you know, and there's something about contraction or anxiety or fear that feels comfortable, you know, now you're in this relationship that feels expansive and, that's, it takes time. It takes time to adapt to that. That's why I think moving slowly in, into a secure relationship works. You know, you get to kind of like titrate into it slowly, like mixing the chemicals together so it doesn't combust, but so that they slowly, you know, mix together. And, um, and in that titration, like you get to expand at, in, a, at, in a manner that is, um, um what's the word in a way where that you have capacity for like you have actually capacity for that kind of expansion because i do think that if you move too quickly into it you do you kind of combust but yeah and so when when you're expanding it does feel different because you're like you're in new skin you're you want to occupy a different part of yourself and you're kind of your your ego is in a sense you talked about it earlier dissolving and and that can be a scary place to be because it's like now who am i you know yeah thank you so much for voicing that because often also uh people say and you know when i hear people say something more than several times i already know that i should be very watchful of that saying because most likely it, it's already become something dead, you know, that most likely it's already some kind of a, um, some kind of a almost avoidant pattern as well. There's just some kind of label that has been put on something in order for us to actually avoid looking deeply into what it is. So for example, the term, I want to be seen, yeah, to be seen, to be seen. And so I always ask my clients, you want to be seen which way <laughs> what is it in you that you want to be seen what is it and so when you're saying that becoming um that discovering another part of yourself or expanding or what is it what is it when you have that abundance because 
instead of put pouring your nervous system into does he love me does he not oh my god he doesn't love me i'm all contracted oh my god he loves me and now i'm all turned on and i'm all wet and now we just had this amazing sex and oh my god again he didn't he didn't cuddle me oh, maybe he doesn't want so that roller coaster which is so rich yeah in chemicals but ultimately leaves you still in the same place contract so instead let's say we're coming in we're looking at each other in a tantric maybe way we are connecting to the divine everything is abundant so who do we become how do we expand what is it that we are connecting to as we expand mm -hmm. i mean life force is what comes to mind you know um what are we connecting to yeah, life force, like, you know, energy, the, the part of ourselves that is, you, you called it earlier, you called it creation, you know? Um, yeah, creative force, yeah. right? Yeah. Creative force, exactly. Yeah. Our, our ability to create, to, 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 to create worlds, to be the artist of your world. What yeah. else? What else? For I, me... Yeah, yeah, I, I can tell you one, like, I'll share one thing um, where I feel like when I feel an abundance of everything, yeah. of love, of everything, I feel like I have more capacity to slow down mm. and connect to the mystery of, of life and nature and consciousness, which I can't if I feel in scarcity. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I mean, I think you just become more connected to yourself. It, it, like a, a part of it, actually, I was talking about, I was taking notes earlier about like what it looks like to move towards, you know, security. And I think a big part of it is, is being present, you know, like it, slowing down in relationships is, is a wonderful concept, but it does take some effort to actually implement that, you know, and it takes a lot like one of the things I constantly say to my clients is like you're jumping in the future you're moving into the future. Like you, you're not going to be able to tell whether something amazing is going to happen or you're you're replaying some trauma from the past right but either way, looking into the future and trying to predict how this is going to work out is you're you're not you're missing being in the in the present, yeah. you know. So I think learning to to come back, like there's just such a such a rich world and that lives in the present that we're constantly missing because we're either moving into the future or moving into the past. You know, like we have a really hard time landing here. So yeah, yeah. I think I think once you connect to that, there's like there's so there's so much available, you know, like you can have these organic needs that arise that influence your creativity. You know, you, there's a lot of emotional like regulation happening within you to where you're, you know, connected to this like constant flow of energy. So. Yeah. But you need to take risks sometimes, right. To let go of the agenda to let go of that agenda to conquer this person, to own this person, to put this secure thing uh, under your belt. Yeah. And it, right. And instead to be in the, in the trust in the moment. Right. Just, right. Just knowing that whatever is happening is probably. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and that's the, and that's the piece that like coming back to, you know, we're always trying to combat uncertainty by predicting. And again, like, that comes from, I think, a time where uncertainty was an unbearable experience. You know, again, if like you're, if you have an inconsistent caretaker, if you have someone that you, you don't know what to expect, that feeling uncertainty can be unbearable. But as an adult, you're, you know, we're, we're capable, we're capable of, of living in the uncertainty. We're capable of, of those big emotions that can sometimes come up whenever, um whenever we we enter into relationship and you know when you can be with that uncertainty that's where like the juices in in a relationship so mm -hmm, beautiful and so let me summarize what we talked about and let's see if there is anything additional that we need to cover sure. so as far as i un understood attachment theory 
is about looking specifically into the strategies that a person ha has developed based on what worked before and especially what worked in certain critical situations, especially in the childhood. And so the person is just trying to feel safe. The person is just trying to be happy and they're using those strategies, like for example, being anxious, which would be like, yeah, give me that tit. Oh my God, give me that milk. Oh my God, I'm so afraid. I need to control this. I need, I need, and you know, I had a client who told me that she was constantly worried that the milk is going to be given away or that she's not going to get it. So she became very controlling and anxious or another strategy. Oh my God, uh, if I don't pull away, I'm going to be strangled right or, or for example yeah if i stop loving and i keep loving that parent which is my first love is going to be taken away from you or they're going to show up drunk or they are not going to show up at all so i better put a break on my feelings or something like that right so so therefore those different styles of attachment get developed and some of them actually magnetize others just to play out that trauma again right yeah, yeah, yeah. And then just, I, we didn't cover this, but I, I think it like attachment is elevated whenever there's themes of trust and dependency, you know, and like auto autonomy and connection. So when we start to touch into these bigger core themes of like trust, dependency, things again, that needed to be met when we were very young, that's when the attachment system starts to get activated because it's like oh this is this feels familiar there's something dangerous about this yeah the last time that i was dependent on someone it didn't go well yeah thank you for that the last time i was dependent on someone that didn't go well so for the for our audience if you felt this way last time i was dependent on someone it didn't go well please put it into the comments that this is something that resonates with you okay and so as we are as we are learning how to be autonomous and, and yet connected and this is an art of itself and we're building out this new blueprint of relating and this new blueprint of 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 love let's say also um we are also coming into understanding and i'm just summarizing what we talked about is that it is much wiser more adult more safer and setting you up for success to take something easy to take this connection little by little instead of rushing into it and fantasizing a lot but rather seeing things as they are allowing yourself to see things as they are is that right is that what we yeah yeah moving slowly you know um noticing when you're it, it's again it's easier said than done but it's like noticing like why why don't i want to be here or why is it difficult like i had a um client that i was working with who you know he's about to go on a couple of dates and he's very excited and and he uh we were talking about you know his intention for a first date and he's like well first dates i'm great i'm i'm really good i get really curious about her and i make her feel amazing and i was like well what about you you know what about you feeling amazing what about you know he's like what i do struggle with is that i um you know uh is is women being curious with me and getting interested in me and i was like so then this is a strategy right the strategy is i'm going to come in hot i'm going to ask her all these brilliant questions i'm going to make her feel amazing but then i get lost in the mix you know and so you know for him it's like okay how can i effort less you know how can i stop efforting so much and showing her such a good time and instead focus on myself you know focus on what i need and what i want wonderful and i'm sure many women can also relate to that over giving solving people's problems like really giving a lot in the beginning and again that setup is going to blow up at a certain point that either either you're going to attract that 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 taker or that narcissist or that emotionally unavailable person and then you have to keep performing and keep performing until you develop resentment loss of desire and painful withdrawal or what, whatever that is so definitely those are the games we play pleasing yeah and that's how we got love and i can see how your client who 
who, who could experience that. So he's basically not giving space for her to see him. He's really not giving space for her to yeah. give something to him either, right? Mm -hmm. And but at the end, this woman ends up in complete like in complete incoherence oh my god the first date was so good and then he never called but he never called because he's just so exhausted from giving and he doesn't want to continue right yeah well so i think you know to to come back to what you were sharing like to sum it up you know is is starting to move away like notice when you're strategizing right if you you learn at a at an early age that in order to have connection you have to strategize you have to do something or be a certain way and so what would happen if you didn't do that what yeah. would be available you know and then and then inside of that there's something new entirely you get to exist in a new world in a new way and and also like there's uncertainty there there's 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 connecting to some deeper needs of like oh i get to you know maybe i don't have to um, do all of the work in this relationship. And if I'm not doing all the work in this relationship, how might I, who might I attract into my life? Wow, that's incredible. I love that. So what would you be like if you weren't strategizing at all, right? So Katya, what would you be like if you weren't strategizing at all in this moment? Would you be any different? Um, I would say I am getting tired. <laughs> And um, I'm ready for some rest. That's what I would say. I would probably get my pillow and we would have a slumber party. <laughs> All right, amazing, Amy. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, and that's exactly what you would say at the end of the day. At the date as well, you would say, actually, you know, this was a good date and uh, it's time for me to replenish my own energy, especially my own feminine energy. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank you so much for your beautiful example and for being so authentic and, and giving so much value. Thank you so much, Katya. And so I would like to ask you if this would be okay, if, uh, if anybody wants to get any private uh, help from you or ask a question, if they could post it in, into the post and then you will be able to respond to them. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, and I can um, I can drop. Uh, I'm not in the Facebook group right now, but once I pop it up, I can drop the two books that I mentioned. Beautiful. Um, I can link my website, and um, yeah, so that sounds great. Beautiful. Well, this was incredible. Thank you so much for coming in. This was so exciting, and hopefully, we can do something again and maybe you know what katya i would like to invite you to our soulmate makeover show to be in the dating advisory committee because then you can also on top of just giving amazing feedback like my students do and our magnetic women do but you can as a professional give feedback and say well this was uh, this kind of attachment style this demonstrated that and that's why our hot seats, by the way, whoever is watching, if you'd like to be considered for a hot seat, please put hot seat into the comments and we will reach out to you. Right, Katya? So we would love to have you. Sure. Tuesday evening. That sounds wonderful. We do it every Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. Thank you so much. And if there is anything else, the last thing that you would like to say to our beautiful yeah. women, Please. Well, I just want to say thank you for having me. This was so much fun and thanks for it. I loved all of everything that you shared about, you know, the, the, I, it's always interesting for me to hear how like you come from this tantric, uh, tantric background and, you know, um, I love all the things that you talk about, like the mystical things that, that you read and how everything just kind of converges, you know, no matter which background we're coming from. So I loved hearing, you know, your rich history and the way that you teach. I think it's so beautiful. So just thank you for, for having me and for supporting you know, all of these amazing women in your practice. And yeah, I'd love to be on the show and yeah, I hope you do something like this again as well. And yeah, so thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So everyone please put into the comments how you liked the interview and what else you would like to learn. Thank you and bye-bye. Have a wonderful Friday night. This is a special time. And so I'm going to stop the live stream and I'll see you. And if you're watching as a replay, please put hashtag replay into the